this this talk is a uh, the, the second spin-off from the from the talk that Katie gave last night in a sense and so I, uh, I've had her help and and wanted to express some appreciation for that but the a few months ago Paul asked me to give a talk at this thing and I said well, what should I talk about and he said burst buffers and and so that's that's about the level of of, of direction that I've had here. Um, so let's move on. So a little bit of, of historical background um, and mostly just for the chance to slip in a joke or two. But the, uh, we, Cray actually, we, we didn't know this until we went back and looked, but we actually had a burst buffer in, in 1984 and uh, for the Cray XMP system, which was a four node computer and uh, the, the, the machine of its time for HPC and then and it had a grand total of 128 megabytes of SRAM memory uh, and it had an IO subsystem that could support up to 20 or 30 hard drives of a, of a gigabyte apiece and uh, with, a, with a six megabyte per second IO channel and uh, it, but it had this thing called a solid state storage device, which somebody found on the Wayback Machine somewhere on the web, and uh, that had a capacity of 1024 megabytes of, of MOS memory, whatever that means. I haven't quite figured it out, but the analogous to DRAM today, and with a channel that supported a gigabyte a second of bandwidth. Um, and so it's, it's just interesting to keep that in mind um, as, as I go through this to just think about the ratios that are involved. The, uh, the amount of time required to dump all of memory to hard drive at 6 megabytes a second would have been about 20 seconds, um, at least from, from if I could run the channel at full speed, and which is it, from my point of view, is like well, why are they? Why did they go to all the trouble to build this burst buffer if they can dump all of memory to disk in 20 seconds? That's really not so bad. Um, the but the time to write all of memory to the SSD was one second. So it's just uh, so it'll be interesting to compare that. And then this is this is for me is an interesting point. Uh, from at least from Cray, I can't speak for everybody, but at least from Cray, for the next 30 years, nothing happened. So this was our, our first and, and uh, would have been last attempt at building a, a solid state burst buffer storage device until um, now. And the, at, at the academic level, there have been a bunch of papers published over the last five or ten years about the potential advantages of using burst buffer as part of the storage hierarchy to improve performance in HPC computing. But the TN8 RFP was really the first time that somebody put real money on the table and said, we need one of these things. And, and in particular, um, it's a collaboration between Los Alamos and Sandia and, San, and uh, NERSC, uh, or Lawrence Berkeley. It, what, what the ACES folks wanted was something that would do checkpoint restart in order to support 90% compute efficiency. That was their goal. Um, the, the, at the scale of machines today, the a typical, if you run a full-scale application, which is something that ASUS actually does, um, they will break if a node breaks, right? So if one of the CPUs in the system stops working and I'm using all the CPUs on my job, then I've lost the job. So I have to save periodically checkpoint files so that I can go back and, and restart from an intermediate spot. And in order to get to 90% efficiency, it turns out that I need to have the amount of time that it takes me to store all of memory to this backing store for these checkpoint files to be about 1 200th of the time that it takes for the machine to break. And 
at the scale of machines that are being built today, uh, unless you do something to make them more reliable, turns out that they break about three times a day. So we, you know, a typical large machine out there with 50,000 nodes or something like that will have up to two or three or four nodes in a day break in some way, and you have to take it out and fix it and put it back. A lot of the time it breaks by just requiring a reboot, but maybe some fraction of the time you actually have to fix it. NERSC, on the other hand, has a totally different environment where they have hundreds of users running hundreds of jobs, but very few of those jobs actually take the whole machine, and none of those jobs run for a week. They all run for a few hours at the most. And so basically because of the rules that they use for, for allowing people to post jobs to the machine, you're not allowed to put a job in that would run for weeks and weeks and weeks. So you as the, as the application writer already have to break up your job into smaller chunks and the probability of one of those failing is a lot less. So they're interested in a burst buffer for different reasons. But the combination of this set of requirements led to the creation by Cray of a, of a first buffer solution, which, um, and this will be the first and last time that I use the, the marketing term for this, is called data warp. Um, the, uh, the interesting points here are that, that Moore's Law has had 30 years to work its magic from the last time that, that the company made this decision and then didn't do it for 30 years. So I have to assume that it was, I, I wasn't there. So I have to assume that th it must have been a little bit painful or there'd have been a second and a third and a fourth version of that that, that never did show up. Th this product has been relatively successful. Uh, it's fairly quickly expanding into most of the other mid and high end procurements that we're involved in. Um, to a, to a a very uh, pleasing degree, I have to say. Um, the solution consists largely of software, and that, that software is being architected and, and designed in a collaborative effort between Sandia, uh, Los Alamos, Berkeley, and Craig. Um, the, the work that we're doing is, uh, I, we have to give credit to the the, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong so I'll avoid it, but the, the effort that Los Alamos has been funding for the last four or five years with, with uh, strong participation of Intel and EMC and a number of other companies in developing concepts and ideas around, uh, around this. But the good, bad, or otherwise data warp is uh, uh, something that, that we're developing, so we're, we're guilty for all of its flaws. Um, so as part of this historical background, it's interesting to think about the, some of the driving forces that led to this change, to think about why, you know, why don't we now use Flash as part of our memory subsystem and why did we not want to do that before. And so I, I went around on the web and I found this drawing that someone had published in 2003 that went back to 1992 or something like that. So it gave a good span of a, of, a, of a decade or so of the cost per unit of flash storage, DRAM storage, and hard drive storage. And uh, the, the hard drive curve is not as, as flat as the other ones, but the flash one is really uh, strongly linear. It has a very Moore's Law character. Um, but that's that's actually quite old. So you can you can go back and populate a couple of points uh, from last year and see how this curve is progressing. And it turns out that the flash curve is very very close to a Moore's law curve over um, all the years since flash was invented, which is not surprising because it's it's it, it scales in the same way that microprocessors do. The uh, the hard drive curve is a little more wobbly, but it's um, it's continuing to scale in terms of the cost per capacity. But, and this is the point at the bottom, 
the scaling and the, there are really three parameters that we care about for storage. One is, is capacity, one is bandwidth, and one is IOPS, how fast can I do things and how fast can I sequentially store stuff onto these things. And the, the bandwidth and IOPS performance of hard drives has, it's not entirely stopped, but it's essentially flat. The hard drives went up to 15,000 RPMs, and at that point, uh, the outside edge of the disk is, is getting close to being unstable, and you can't spin them any faster, and it takes a lot of power. And now the market for those is disappearing because of flash. So 15,000 RPM drives are, are legacy drives. They're disappearing. Uh, 10,000 RPM drives are still around, but um, high density drives are moving down from 7,200 RPMs down in some cases to 5,000 RPM just because of the energy savings. So disks more and more are being used for warm or cold storage. And so we may have actually passed the, the peak performance of hard drives in terms of bandwidth and IOPS. Whereas the, those features of, of flash memory scale well with capacity. So as we scale down the, the capacity, the line widths are shrinking, the transistors are getting smaller, they go faster. So the IOPS are going up and the bandwidth is going up. The, just, just for fun, if I, if I pick two typical high-end devices, uh, and I don't mean to suggest that any of the ratios here are canonical in any way, but just, and, the, and these are numbers that I picked out of the head from you know my own recollection, but if I take a six terabyte hard drive, I can do about 150 megabytes a second. That's the peak transfer rate. Maybe maybe it's a little higher at the outside edge. Um, I can do about 150 IOPS on a spindle, and they cost about $300. So the the capacity per dollar is about 20 gigabytes a dollar or five cents a gigabyte. The bandwidth is about half a megabyte per second per dollar, and the IOPS are about half an IOP per second per dollar. If we look at a, a sort of large uh, enterprise class NVMe solid state device uh, from today, um, imagine a device with four terabytes of, of flash, uh, sequential bandwidth of, let's say, three gigabytes a second. Um, by the end of this year, there'll be devices with four Actually, by the end of this year, we'll have devices with 12 terabytes and four gigabytes a second. Um, and, and maybe I'm being a little conservative, but a couple hundred thousand IOPS, maybe it's a half a million IOPS. Uh, depends on how you measure it. But the cost is exciting. The cost is maybe, just pick a number, $8,000. Um, but if I look at the ratios, it's about a half a gigabyte per dollar, so two dollars a gigabyte. That was the the bandwidth is roughly the same. It's very close to a half a megabyte per second per dollar, and the IOPS are huge. That's it's in this case 25, maybe it's 50 IOPS per second per dollar. Um, so if I if I look at the relative performance of flash versus a hard drive. In terms of capacity, it's a 20th in this case of these two devices. I, well, let me, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing, and this is important actually. The, we're looking at, at a single component, a disk or a, a flash unit, right? But that's not, that's not the solution. The solution is those things packaged into rack units with power supplies and servers and cables and, and heaven knows what else. The disks are inexpensive and consequently the, the nest cost, the cost of putting all of the infrastructure around it is actually very high. So the percentage of the system cost for a storage, rotating storage solution that goes to the hard drives is, is maybe a third or less, whereas solid state devices are expensive. So in the same kind of configuration, the percentage of the cost that goes to the flash device is maybe 70% or higher. And so that, what that means is if I want to compare the cost of these two devices, I need to throw in another factor of at least two, which is what I did. So the, um, 
ratio of the capacities is about 1 20th. Disks are 20 times more cost effective than flash. Bandwidth, flash is about two times more cost effective. Maybe it's a little higher, but it's, it's in that range. And for IOPS, flash is at least 100 times more cost effective. So that's, this is a relatively, the, the, the capacity story has been around a long time. So disks are, are much more performant than flash on capacity and they always will be for a really long time. Um, but the one that's changed, well IOPS have always been good for flash, but the one that's really changed in my mind is bandwidth. So the bandwidth of the flash devices within the last two or three years has crossed over the bandwidth of rotating storage. And that's what's driving people to go from publishing papers to writing big checks and putting devices on the floor. So that's, that's why we're here. Um, hardware architecture. So this is a, a picture of a, of a canonical HPC system with some attached storage. It's highly simplified. Um, but we've got a bunch of switches at the top connected with links that we will refer to sometimes as the high-speed network. Um, and then we have a bunch of compute nodes attached to those switches. And we have some specialized devices attached to those switches that are called I.O. nodes. And the difference is that the I.O. nodes have connectors that connect to the outside world. Otherwise, they look about the same. They look like CPUs in memory. And then sitting behind those I.O. nodes is a there's another set of switches, which I didn't draw because it's I ran out of room. Um, and in, in this case, we're looking at a Lustre file system as an example. But there's a set of switches that's connecting the I.O. nodes to a set of file servers. And sitting behind those file servers, this being Lustre or a set of OSTs. So where would we add? flash memory or non-volatile memory to this solution. Well, one, one obvious place is to say let's put lots of SSDs in the, uh, the file servers, right? Let's put it in the file system. So then that's actually been done. And that's, that's a, a product that we already sell. Um, and, and SSDs play a role in there. Um, but it's not as performant as it could be. So the next possible point is to say, let's put flash inside of the I.O. nodes, um, but let's use a fancier version of flash. So instead of using an SSD, let's use a non-volatile NVMe device, which has higher bandwidth. Um, I think eventually NVMe is going to displace everything, but today, if you've got a big JBOD full of spinning disks, it's easy to pull a couple out and stick in some, some SATA or SAS SSDs. And then finally, the next possibility is to put non-volatile memory. Could be NVMe, could be um, NVDIM, it could be something on the, on the compute node. And so the, the, in today's time frame, given this set of choices, the one that we've opted for is to put stuff on the I.O. node. So let me show a slightly different flavor of the same drawing. If, if I, so I'm I want to talk about the memory storage hierarchy. Um, and, and this is really reflecting the same drawing that we were just looking at. But the, the notion is, is that the, on the top, above the high-speed network, are the compute nodes. And I can put memory these days, I can put memory on the compute node. I'm speaking slightly in the future tense here because um, KNL, which is the target of TN8 or Cori, uh, as, as it was described yesterday, will have in package memory. And that in package memory is limited in size, but it is really fast. Um, so it's, it's possible to put memory on the, on the CPU die that delivers about five times the memory bandwidth that is possible to achieve through DIMMs. And this is, this is uh, nothing, nothing earth shattering here. This is the same technology that's being used in GPUs. 
to deliver high performance. So then beside the CPU, I can put in DIMM sockets, I can put DRAM. Also in DIMM sockets, I can put some kind of NVRAM. Um, or perhaps on the other side of the CPU, on, a, on a, another kind of socket, I could put some amount of non-volatile memory. The problem with putting non-volatile memory there is that um, it, it takes space. And we really want to package uh, our server infrastructure as much as, as possible. So most server designs, if we, if we add a bunch of, how much do I have? Five minutes. Oh my goodness. All right. The, um, so I have to speed up. So the one in the middle is the, is the so let, me, let me build this slide because I'm, so this is the set of devices that are present in TN8 and are the memory hierarchy that we've chosen to implement in that system. So we have in-package memory, we have DRAM, we, NVRAM isn't quite ready for this application, um, but NVMe on the I.O. nodes between the high-speed network and the SAN is ready, and that's where we're putting it. And then finally, we have hard drives behind the object servers. The, here's a photograph that shows a, an I.O. blade and then the same I.O. blade populated by a set of, th this I.O. blade is both the I.O. blade that gets used for, for anything, in fact, anything that requires an interface. And then the one at the bottom shows the same thing with uh, six or 12 terabytes of, of flash in there for a couple of nodes. So the, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about burst buffer use cases. I'm not going to talk anything about the design of the burst buffer software today, but just describe the set of problems that we're trying to solve and the, the goal that's, that we're aiming at. So the, the most important for really big machines with really long running jobs is checkpoint restart. And we're able to improve system efficiency. Um, Similarly, pre-stage and post-drain, and these are requirements actually that were collected by ASIS and NERSC and, and were part of the RFP. Um, if I have a job that requires reading a lot of data in or writing a lot of data out at the end of the job, I can write that to a, read from or write to a burst buffer and then start another job on the compute resource. So I improve the efficiency of the compute resource and push the writing back to the file system off so that it overlaps computing on the next job. Um, similarly, if the, if the duty cycle of I.O. is low, 5 or 10 percent, then I can make that stuff go faster but make my storage less expensive by spreading out the, the writing. Um, private storage means that Unlike most HPC systems, I can actually afford to make the, the add, add small virtual disks that I can add to each compute node on demand. So we, we, we don't like to put hard drives in large scale systems. We, we do put them in clusters, but not in high end systems. Um, with Flash, I can basically say every time you start a job, if you want a personal private disk on every compute node, just ask and we'll give you one. And then when you're done, we'll erase it and start over and give it to somebody else. Uh, shared storage is saying that um, I can create a file system that's spread across a bunch of burst buffer nodes and then manage a job where I have multiple phases in my job and I can, one job can write a file, the next job can read the file or I can have uh, large databases that are constant that can be read. Um, and finally, the, the in-transit analysis, again, is the notion that um, if I want to do data steering or grab intermediate results and visualize those, I can do that without taking the time to go to the rotating storage. So let me skip, skip, skip. Skip, because I'm running out of time. Skip. So this is the 
the software view, so on, on an, a compute node, we have an application running. Somewhere in the kernel, we, we do I.O. forwarding so that we take every time anybody on, the, on a compute node wants to do an I.O. operation, we basically grab the parameters, ship it off to an I.O. node. The I.O. node then writes that into the SSD and then manages whether it, or you know, if it has to, manages copying the data from the SSD out to the parallel file system. The, this could be done at user space where it could be done in the kernel. It turns out if we do it in the kernel, we get the broadest set of use cases supported. If we put it in user space, then it does not, it makes it hard to do things like swap, for example, which work from the kernel. Um, we support three modes um, of writing to burst buffers, either striped or private or load balanced. And these are some very early results from NERSC on, on a test bed that has been set up to look at for a system with comparable solid state and, and parallel file system I.O. What's the impact of migrating jobs from parallel file system to flash, and they're seeing very, very good results. Um, so this, they're quite excited about this. And here's a, here's a similar one. So I'll take questions.